friend of mine asked me this past week, so how's your spring been going so far? And I gave them pretty much kind of a typical answer. Busy. Busy. Now, if somebody asked you that question, chances are that word will probably find its way in there somewhere. Sometimes we say it's really busy, sometimes crazy busy, or if I want to sound a little bit more pious, I'll say it's going pretty good, but pretty busy. Busy, you know, three kids and school and trying to keep track of the news cycle. Don't you just love that? It's just busy, constant pace of busyness, busyness. And oftentimes, though, my busyness, your busyness, points to the fact that we're trying to almost escape from what's going on deep in here. A, a despair, maybe a fear uncertainty. And if I just keep busy enough, then I won't think about all that other stuff going on. I won't think about the COVID situation or the economic situation or my family situation or this trial or suffering or, or this loved one. If I just stay busy enough, I won't have to think about that. If you found yourself in that trap, yeah, last week for me, we just stay busy enough, keep the rat race going, keep the cycle going like a gerbil on the pinwheel, then I won't have to stop and think about all the stuff that I don't want to think about in my life right now, or society, or culture, or whatever it might be. We get busy with a lot of good things. Your busyness may be teaching, serving at church. How many of you think that <laughs> that maybe for me or church leaders, we're kind of telling you, be busy. You can raise your hand if you want to. <laughs> be busy, right? Keep going. Keep the rat race going. Keep on going. Be busy. We can do serving and teaching, evangelizing, reading the Bible, all good things. Totally. I didn't say anything bad, right? Good things. But what is the most vital work of every Christ follower? It's, it's not first evangelizing or serving or giving or teaching or even reading the Bible. The most vital work, the most important action of every Christ follower is prayer. Prayer, which causes and us and prompts us to put away all the other busyness. And there in the silence, we can be scared. It almost can be scary because then everything that's, that's been boiling inside here kind of bubbles to the surface and we start thinking about all the things that we didn't want to think about, which is why we were staying busy. And then we start telling God about what's really going on. Ah. James the Apostle, half-brother of Jesus, known as Camel Knees. There's an ancient revitalized painting of James the Apostle in his letter he talks a lot about the work that flows from faith, but there are three points in his sermon letter, and his letter is a sermon, and it's filled with illustrations and analogies and bullet points. It's just, in fact, some people call it the Proverbs of the New Testament because he doesn't pull any punches. He's just, well, he was a man of such prayer known as camel knees because his knees had these thick calluses from praying all the time. And at the beginning of his letter, at verse 5 of chapter 1 and verse 2 and 3 of chapter 4, and then at the end of the letter, he emphasizes the most vital work, the most important action every Christ follower must take, prayer. Prayer. To people in suffering, to people in trial, to people in testing. And over this past year, we have faced testing and that might have been financial testing for some of you. That might be emotional testing for some of you. For some of you, that might be physical testing, suffering, loss, pain. It might be for some of you, persecution or opposition or temptation. We face tests from without, temptation from within. All of these are trials against our faith and trials and tests of our faith. And two people facing those kinds of things, like you and like me, James, inspired by the Holy Spirit, writes this letter, this sermon, to point us to the most important work that flows from faith, which is prayer. 
Turn with me to James chapter 1 first. What is the most vital work? It's simply this, prayer. That's point number one. One thing about prayer is that it is not intellectually challenging, right? There, there's an, it's not an academic exercise, and yet it's challenging in a deeper heart way because it, 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 it propels us to expose our hearts before God and open up what's really going on inside to our Heavenly Father. The most vital work of every Christ follower is prayer. And so, in chapter 1, verse 5, I'll begin in verse 3, you'll find where he says, Consider it all joy. Think about it. Look upon it. Consider it all joy when you fall into various trials or temptations, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, and let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And the word for various trials is the word from which we get polka dot. All different kinds, shapes and sizes. And isn't it true that when you are falling into a test, it's like you're walking along, and then suddenly, ah, I didn't see that coming. That's what a test, that's what suffering, that's what a trial feels like. Have you gone through that this week? You, you didn't see that pit right in front of you on the trail. And there, Sometimes there might even be a lion inside. What is going on? But you can consider it, look upon that with joy because through the challenge, through the suffering, God is going to do a work and produce in you what you can never produce on your own. And so then he says, when you lack wisdom, verse 5, but if any of you lacks wisdom, that's all of us pretty much all the time because we don't have all the wisdom we need for every circumstance in life. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. This is prayer. Praying is asking of God and receiving from God. Asking, requesting, bringing your petitions. Let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. I remember memorizing this verse when I was a kid in the KJV. Generously and he upbraideth not. Remember that? Upbraideth. I'm, Mom, what is he talking about? Upbraideth. It means without reprimand. I've had a number of good bosses in my life, but on occasion I've had a boss who when you ask for help, they shame you for asking. Can't you get this figured out on your own? I mean, come on, fend for yourself. I hired you to figure this out. That's not the way God is. When we come to him and when we fall into that pit of testing, trial, suffering, persecution, temptation from within, or testing out from outside, and we fall into that, we run to God for help, and sometimes the most profound prayer is simply one word, help! I don't know what to do! I have no clue! And God doesn't say, don't you have this figured out yet, Josh? Don't you have this figured out yet, Stephanie? I mean, come on! You've been following Jesus for decades. You have the Bible in your hand. No, instead, what God does is he gives you more help than you even know how to ask for. Generously pouring over the help that you need in your time of need. And he doesn't reprimand you for it. Isn't that good news, God? He doesn't shame you, guilt you. He doesn't say, why are you coming to me? He pours out help. What is the most vital work of every Christ follower? Prayer. Not serving or teaching or leading or evangelizing, all good things, reading your Bible, wonderful, but we must pray first that God will give us understanding so that when we read his word, it'll be applied to our life. We must pray first for the spiritually lost before we seek to evangelize them. We must pray first that our serving is flowing from self-giving love, self-sacrificial service, so that God, not ourself, ourselves, are glorified through it, but God is glorified through our serving. Prayer comes first. Help, Lord, in my time of need. Prayer is how we put on the armor of God for the battles we face. This is why in Ephesians chapter 6, after going through the armor of God, the apostle Paul says this. He'll put here on the screen in just a second here. Ephesians chapter 6, he says, with all prayer and petition. So everything that's come before in his instructions on utilizing the armor of God 
It comes through prayer, with all prayer and petition at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, beyond the alert, with all perseverance and petition. Petition is another word for prayer. For all the saints, and pray on my behalf, because I need help, Paul is saying. That utterance, the word, may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. You see, prayer is not a magnet on the Christian life, like a magnet on the refrigerator of the Christian life. It's the foundation of the Christian life. It is the, it's what flows from faith. It's the beginning, it's the middle, it's the end. It should be the start and the saturation of the Christian life and the finish of the Christian life. If you're on mission for Jesus, it flows from an intimate relationship with God, which is founded in prayer. And just in case you're wondering, I'm preaching to myself just as much as anybody else. Because when I fall into a test or a trial, the first thing that I think about is not often help God. It's how can I get out of this myself? What do I need to do? What list do I need to build? What objectives? What plan? Try to sort it all out. If you take a look at James chapter 4, James chapter 4, verse 2, this is the middle point there of the sermon. He, he says, I will read verse 1. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source of your, of your pleasures that wage war in your members, is not that the source of it? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask, and you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. He's writing to believers. Conflict is rooted in our pride, and when we go to God in prayer, all pride must dissipate. Preoccupation with self must disappear. J.C. Ryle, a pastor from a long, long time ago, said this, and this will appear on the screen as well. He's talking about prayer and about sin in our heart. You can throw that quote up there in just a moment. It will appear. There it is. Prayer will consume sin or sin will choke prayer. In the moment, praying and sinning will never live together in the same heart. You see what he's saying? Prayer must be the beginning and the middle flowing all the way through the Christian life and the finish of the Christian life. It's not a magnet on the refrigerator. It's not a sticky note. Oh, I'll get to praying when I have a chance. And yet often I, I treat it like that. I, I, a minute to a minute here, and God is calling us to pray all the time. Throughout each moment of each day, we need help, we need wisdom. Wisdom is seeing life from God's point of view. So, what is, prayer? what is the most vital work for every Christ follower? It's prayer. Now James gives us, in the end of his letter, six reasons to pray. Six reasons why we should pray. There are lots of reasons in the Bible about why we should pray, but here are at least six. So I want you to turn now to James chapter 5. James chapter 5 to six, see these six reasons why we should pray. Verse 13 to 18. Are you there? Yes? All right, good. You're with me. Is anyone among you suffering? Is anyone among you suffering? And there we see all the way back to verse 5 of chapter 1, which we've already covered. Verse 3, when you are going through trials, when you're going through suffering, how many of you today are saying, I I'm suffering in a relationship with my adult child, or I'm suffering in how my marriage is falling apart, or I'm suffering through this financial difficulty and I'm trying to claw out, or I'm suffering emotionally, my brain just isn't working right, I and I or I'm making these bad decisions, and I, I'm I can't figure this out. I suffering comes in all different kinds of shapes and sizes. Remember? Various trials, and temptations. And what does James say? Then he must pray. Then you must pray. First reason for praying is that it is God's prescription in every circumstance of life, and so prayer changes our perspective. 
It gives us God's vantage point, his view about the circumstances that we are in. If we're suffering, we know that we're not alone. We're crying out to the one who can give us help in our time of need. He's not going to reprimand us. He's not going to turn against us. He's not going to shame us. He will always answer in his time. It may not be the answer or the solution that we're looking for, but he will answer. Then he must pray. Prayer is entering into communion with God and communicating with him because you're in right relationship with him. So when you're going through suffering over this past year, year and a half, we faced suffering, we faced loss as families, as a church, in a community. By the way, it's so nice to see your faces this morning. <laughs> we felt like, amen, yeah. It felt like we lost part of our humanity. Right? Needing to be cautious, don't misunderstand me. We've lost loved ones to COVID. We've lost loved ones in the middle of COVID from other illnesses and not able to see them in the hospital like we long for or not able to have the funeral that we wanted to have. All these kinds of things happen. That's suffering. That hurts deeply. And God invites us to pray because prayer changes our perspective in the middle of the suffering. He's walking with us in the suffering, giving us wisdom and guidance. Number two reason See, in the next line of verse 13, is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Is your life going well? Or are you experiencing growth or a transformation in somebody's life? Or seeing somebody come to salvation in Christ or fruit bearing in the Christian life, then you're to sing praises. Prayer, prayer leads to praise, and really, prayer is requesting of God, and praise is responding to God in praying, we praise and we, and we request, and so he's still talking about prayer. If you're in that moment of being filled with thankfulness, then give thanks to God because our trust is not in ourselves. Our trust is in the one who's providing for us, and so we give thanks to him. This reminds me of a story of Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16. Now, front loaded with this question. What if you were out ministering for Jesus and people who hated what you were saying grabbed you in a mob and they stripped you down to your underwear and then in, with bamboo rods beat you almost to the point of death and then took you to a dark prison cell and threw you down into the inner part of it. How would you respond? I'll tell you what I would do. I'd go over in the corner and I'd cry. I'd just, ah. I'd probably have a splitting headache. Not probably, I know I would bruises, maybe your, maybe your jawbone is broken from the rods they beat you with, maybe you cut blood everywhere, missing three or four teeth, so, by the way, and teeth pain, can you think about that, a toothache, think about having bamboo rods hit you in the face, busting teeth out, this is Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16, and what do these crazy guys do? Turn with me, let's find out. Acts chapter 16. After being beaten with rods severely, stripped of their robes and thrown in prison, Acts chapter 16, we find them in verse 24. Hear this, and he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison. That's why I said, in the dark corner of the musty, mildewy, damp prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. There's that sequence, prayer and praise. Prayer leads to praise. Prayer changes your perspective about the suffering. Instead of just crying in pain and woe is me and I hate my life and why did this happen to me, Paul and Silas, empowered by God and filled with the Holy Spirit, they're praying and they're singing thanks to God for what he is doing in their lives. That's not the way my brain works, naturally speaking. Prayer leads to praise. It changes our perspective. And what happens 
Well, there was a great earthquake and the foundations of the prison house were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were unfastened. And when the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors open, of course, he thinks now he's done for, so he prepares to kill himself. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, verse 28, don't harm yourself or we're all here. The lights come on and they rush in. And this jailer and his whole household are converted to Jesus Christ. See, God is doing something through the suffering, patience, producing a work in us and through us. And when we pray our perspective about even the worst of circumstances, I can't think of a circumstance much worse than what Paul and Silas were in at that moment. And yet God worked through that to the praise of his glorious grace. And he wants to do that through my life and through your life, no matter the suffering that you're facing today. Do you agree with that this morning? And so when we pray, it changes our perspective. And when we pray, it leads to praise, even if it might seem crazy to praise God in that circumstance. Look at the next line, verse 14. Third reason to pray, prayer restores the sick. Is any among you sick? Anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church and they are to pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Pause right there. You see, there's two movements here. If there's someone and the physical illness is within view, then out of faith, they call for the elders of the church, come and pray. And then they anoint them with oil. Now, there's three different meanings for this oil here, okay? And we got to dig into this because there's question marks in some of your heads about this. What is he talking about here? Some say that the oil is a, a, a special sacrament that in and of itself carries, say, a, a blessing. And some say that this oil is, a, is actually similar to medicinal use of medication today. So back then in the first century, they, they would have prayed over someone and then they would have brought various oils medicinally. And then there's a third definition of this, and this is an emblematic symbol of faith, similar to what when, when kings were anointed in the Old Testament. The anointing oil, that God's blessing, God's grace would be upon this person And by receiving that, you're demonstrating your trust in God. I think that's most likely in view here. It's emblematic symbol of that person's faith and the faith that we're trusting God for this situation. Now, you may disagree with me on that, and that's okay. It's not an essential of the Christian faith. But it's a, either way, it's a demonstration of faith in God that this sick person calls for the shepherds. That's another word for elders. The the shepherds, the elders come, pray over me. And this implies they aren't able to go anywhere themselves. They pray over them, anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. Notice that he keeps saying they're anointed with oil, prayed over in the name of the Lord, and it says again, and the Lord will raise him up. This is to say that God is the healer, not a human. I believe that God can heal. I don't believe in healers, but I believe in the healer, right? And God can heal people. He may not will it, but we still believe he can do it, right? It may may not be part of his sovereign plan in all that he's doing in a person's life or in a family's life or in a church in in his amazing sovereign work over creation to heal someone we love from cancer. But they will be healed, right? Remember the story just about a year and a half ago, Tony Evans, Dr. Tony Evans, pastor in Dallas, Texas, his wife passed away. And his son in the service talked about, you know, God, I know you can do it. Why aren't you healing her? We love her. I don't want to lose her. And then the truth rang into his mind from the work of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. She would either be healed or she would be healed. You see, this is not the end of the story. This life is not all that there is. God can heal someone for his glory. But ultimately, all of us are going to be healed. 
the aches, the pains, the diseases, the chronic illness that you're facing, there will be a day when all the tears will be wiped away. In faith, we put our trust in God. Prayer changes our perspective. Number two, prayer leads to praise. Number three, prayer restores the sick. Number four, prayer demonstrates our faith. The prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed any committed sins, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. To be righteous is to be in right standing with God. To be in right standing with God comes not by our own behavior or merit, right? But by God's grace. That we are brought into right standing with God by His mercy. Clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. We receive the righteousness of Jesus and we're brought into right relationship with God. And so when we pray, it demonstrates our faith and of the one who's sick, of the elders praying. Notice that. The prayer offered in faith. Turn with me back to James chapter 1 because he talks about this when referencing prayer. When he says, ask for wisdom, right? It will be given to him without reprimand. Verse 6 of chapter 1, he says, but he must ask in faith without any doubting for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord being double-minded, unstable in all his ways. But if you are in right standing with God, you know, as the writer of the Hebrews said, that when you, in, when you are in your time of need, you can approach him, you can come to him, and he'll give you help, and you can go into the throne room of the king, and you are his child, and he hears everything that is on your heart, and he responds. And so you put your faith in that God. How many of you are, are suffering, are sick? Maybe it's not a physical illness. Maybe it is. Maybe it's an emotional illness. Maybe it's mental illness. God invites you to his throne room of grace as your loving Heavenly Father. Bring healing, bring restoration, and you come to him in your time of need with faith in this God the one and true and living God who loves you. In John chapter 6, verse 37, Jesus said, all who come to me I will in no wise, no, not ever cast out. That's a picture of the king's courtroom, that you belong there and you'll never be thrown out of the king's courtroom because you're a child of the king and you can come to this throne of grace Anytime, anywhere, no matter the circumstance, because it's God's prescription in every circumstance. That's the gift of prayer. Prayer leads to praise. Prayer restores the sick. Prayer demonstrates our faith. Prayer leads to forgiveness. Prayer leads to forgiveness. Look closely at verse 15 again. And if he has or if they have committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. There's a physical healing in view, but there's also spiritual, relational, emotional healing that God can bring restoration and renewal to what right now may be presently broken in your life. Forgiveness of your sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what John said in chapter 1 of his first letter. He is faithful. We may, be, may struggle with faithfulness, but he remains faithful to us. Prayer leads to forgiveness. If we bottle it up, if we hide away, and we put all of our stuff hidden away in the bottom drawer of a closet so that only we know about it, well, God knows about it too, but nobody else we're cutting ourselves off from the healing promised in that passage. It's when you get it out and you, and you bring it up and you say, Lord God, I need your help. 
I've sinned against you, I have turned away from you, or I can't fix this in my life, and you bring other people into the equation, and you say, I need your help. Pray for me, or forgive me. Now, all illness is not the cause, it's not caused by sin. James makes that clear here when he says, and if he has committed sins, you see, not all sickness or illness is the cause of sin in your life. That was the predominant view in first century Jewish culture. If you're sick, you must be sinning. Is it if, if is important, if he has committed sins, they'll be forgiven him. But confess, confession of your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. This is why we have thrive groups here and Sunday school classes and other prayer groups going on because when we're together and we confess our sins to one another, therein is the place of healing. Scott Craig, Lois Montague, Sue Rosencrantz are leading Celebrate Recovery every Wednesday. And Scott launched it the first Wednesday. I heard him say, here's what Celebrate Recovery is all about. It's about running to and meeting Jesus and meeting with Jesus together with other people. And in that place, you experience his healing. And yet so many of us cut ourselves off from that healing because we're trying to save face. God already knows what's, at, what's going on in here in your heart, in your mind. He knows everything that's going on in your life, but you have to let it out. To him and to other people, not everybody, but to other people who are walking with Jesus who will give grace and you experience his healing because we're all broken and ultimately we're all suffering. Some of us are just better at hiding it. Or like I began, sometimes some of us are just better at staying busy to distract ourselves from really what's going on inside. But there is healing when you turn to God in prayer. Confess your sins to one, or one another. Pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer, it's effectual. You're in right standing with God. God works through prayer. And then because James is a preacher, he brings in a story. Elijah. Point number six is this. Prayer unleashes God's power. Look at verse 17 and 18. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. What's he saying? He's saying he's just a man just like you. Nobody special. Yes, he was a prophet of God, but he was a follower of God. He was human, 100% human. He was a sinner just like any other human. He was a man of nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months and then he prayed again and the sky poured rain and the earth produced its fruit turn with me to first kings chapter 18 i want you to see this incredible story first kings 18 verse 37 there's a purpose in elijah's prayer the purpose is that god's power and his name would be honored and that the people would turn back to the God who is their creator and acknowledge him. And so it says in verse 37, Elijah's prayer, answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God. This should be the bottom line purpose of all our prayers, that God himself would be glorified, that God himself would be acknowledged through our lives. And that you have turned their heart back again. I'm praying that they will know that you are God and turn back to you, the one true God. And then in verse 39, after the Lord answers his prayer, look at this. A fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. If some of you don't know that story, I encourage you to read through chapters 18 and 19 later on today. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, and they use the most reverence name for God there, Yahweh. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Elijah was praying according to God's will. If we pray, Lord God, our desire is that through this circumstance, or through this way, that people would recognize that you are the one true and living God, and that you would turn them to you. Wouldn't God love to answer that prayer? Absolutely, because it is God's will that none should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. Prayer unleashes God's power. And so look at verse 
40, then Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and slew them there. Ooh. Not recommending that for 21st century Christians. That's different era of God's reign over the people of Israel. Verse 41, although we do know that God will bring just judgment on the wicked when Christ returns. It's not our job, it's Christ's job. And he will do it with perfect justice in the end. Now Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of the roar of a heavy shower. I'll go down to verse 46. Then the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and outran Ahab to Jezreel. And God answered Elijah's prayer, and rain came down. Prayer changes our perspective. Prayer leads to praise. Prayer restores the sick. Prayer leads to forgiveness of sin. Prayer demonstrates our faith. Prayer unleashes God's power. Six reasons among many reasons to pray. And so, it was months ago, Carson, our little guy, he's now four years old, one morning, he was, down, he was at the top of our stairs and he had something in his hand and turned and he went tumbling down our stairs. Remember when that happened to your child or children and you're scared and you run, oh, and he's down at the bottom of the stairs and he's crying. We pick him up and he was bruised up a little bit, but nothing was broken. Later that day, he was back at the top of the stairs and I was there and instinctively he went, Daddy, hand. And we walked down the stairs together. And when we fall down into temptations from within, trials from without, suffering, testing of our faith, God is right there and we can reach out. And he's there and he loves us and he's not going to run away from us and he's not going to reprimand us and he's going to demonstrate his power in our lives. He may not fix every problem you're facing right now, but in the end, you will experience hope and a healing and a daily communion with him through this life and on into the next. Would you close your eyes and let's pray together. The way we pray, the how-to of prayer is simply this. You may, you may want to jot this down, but it's very simple. To pray with a heart and right relationship to God and others. And number two, you pray with a faith fervent and unwavering in God. Not like the waves of the sea tossed back and forth. But your trust is grounded in the one who created you, who knows everything you've ever said or done, and he loves you. And you're in right relationship with him by his grace, the gift of salvation, but also with others. Maybe for some of you here this morning, that's the sticky wicket. Because there's a conflict, there's a breach between a, a friend or a family member. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, of husbands to live with their wives in an understanding way as a cherished vessel, as a weaker vessel, meaning a piece of fine china, so that your prayers, men, will not be hindered. That's convicting to me. Maybe there's some guys here in the house, you, like I, often struggle to not live with our wives in an understanding way as a fellow heir of the grace of fellow heir of the grace of life. And that could hinder our prayers being heard by God. So confess that to God. Be free of that by being forgiven by God. Turn to your spouse and re request her forgiveness. I had to do that this week. Maybe you do too. Right relationship to God and others and a faith fervent and unwavering in God.
Lord, we thank you and we praise you. Yes, we praise you even in the midst of a trial or a suffering or a test. That you are with us. You're near to us. As we draw near to you, you don't run away. You're nearer still. And we're amazed today that you in no wise, no, not ever cast us out of the throne room. Because we're there not by our own merit, but by your grace in the first place and adopted as your children into the family. So today as a church family, we come to you with a lot of reasons why we need help. With my brothers and sisters here, we're, we're saying help God, help us God, we need your help. Some of us have adult children running off into the deep end of destruction. Some of us have teenagers making bad choices and heading in the wrong direction. Some of us have a marriage on the rocks or maybe we're just in sorrow about a marriage that's ended. Maybe we're grieving the loss of a loved one or we're facing a raging addiction, a temptation in our heart and it seems like it's every single minute of every single day and we need your help. Maybe it's an anger issue, pride issue, rearing its ugly head. Lord God, forgive us, cleanse us, heal us, Lord. And oh, Lord, forgive us for being busy for the sake of being busy or trying to be distracted, or trying to escape what's really raging in our hearts and forgetting the most important work of prayer. Lord, we pray that our work would first begin with the work of prayer in all that we do in our serving, in our leading, in our teaching, our giving, our evangelizing our workaday jobs in every aspect of it, we pray our work would begin with the work of prayer. Prompt us in that, Lord. Strengthen our faith as we approach you in prayer. We need you, O oh God. And we hear, wait on you to respond as our loving Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, amen.